Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. I am super excited for this video. Uh, this is one I've really wanted to do for a long time. As you guys have seen, my, uh, my new series of videos where I'm talking to horticulturalists around the country and just down the road from me <laughs> is probably one of the top horticulturalists in America, if not the world, um, is, is Mr. Tony Avent here. Um, can you introduce yourself and just give us a little history of your time? In well, well, um, um I've been gardening uh, all my life, from uh, born and raised here in Raleigh, and uh, I spent 16 years as landscape director at our North Carolina State Fairgrounds, yep. and then got the nursery going. And so we've created a private botanic garden research facility funded by a mail order nursery. So right. our gardens are called Juniper Level Botanic Gardens because we're in the little community of Juniper Level, and our nursery is called Plant Delights, and that generates all the income to pay for all our botanic garden work. How, how old is the nursery now? We're now 35 years old here, so mm -hmm. started in 86. So right. been here a while and uh, been very blessed. Right, yeah, and it's, this is a, for those of you watching the video, sometimes you complain that you might not be able to uh, find something. Uh, the perennials we'll be looking at, you know, definitely on their website is a place to, uh, to start. This garden um, is, your collection of plants is different than probably any other, you know, any other I can explore any place. How many taxa are actually in this? Well, we're, we're currently over 27,000 different taxa, which means different kinds of plants. So it's one of the largest plant collections in the world. So our, our goal when we started was to see how many plants we could grow here in Zone 7B Raleigh. Right. And it turns out quite a few, and we're not even close to the end. And, and how many have you killed? Have you killed more than the 27,000? We have. We have killed just <laughs> over 55,000 different kinds of plants. Right. So as, as the late J.C. Rawson said, if you're not killing plants, you're not growing as a gardener. So for for us, it's all about learning, and it's just like uh, like Edison said, I've learned many ways that didn't work to create electricity. Right. We've learned many ways that didn't work to grow plants. So each time we kill one, we learn something new, and then we try it in a different place and different place, and right. uh, we're pretty stubborn, so we don't give up until we really You're truly right. have found right. that it cannot be grown in our area. Right, okay, so we're gonna walk around like I always do in these videos, and Tony's gonna show us some of his uh, favorite plants right this minute, um, which will change probably on the, on the walk through this garden. Uh, and I'll talk to, talk to you more about uh, upcoming open houses here. One of the first things you'll notice on the corner of the office here is this incredible fur. Can you tell me something about it? Yeah, this is a uh, Turkish fur. This is Abies bornmuliana. It's a fur that's virtually unknown in the east. It's grown a lot on the west coast, but what an incredible plant. It's like having a live Fraser fir Christmas tree that, that actually grows and lives and thrives here in right. hot, humid southeast U.S. It's amazing, and it would have been limbed all the way to the gr ground. You've yeah, it was a few years ago. It tried to eat our sidewalk, and we actually wanted to use the sidewalk, so we had to lift right. its skirt up a little bit. But otherwise, that's never been touched. It never needs any pruning. It's just an amazing plant. And this was grown from a seed, so this is probably now right. 20 years old. Right. Where, where is it? I mean, how much elevation? Where is it native? It's native to the valleys of uh, of Turkey. Uh, okay, all so, so it's a lower area. elevation. So yeah, that's yeah, probably part of the. Yeah, it's not a high elevation because high elevation firs really don't like us here because we get too hot at night. But right. this one absolutely thrives. Isn't that wild? It's beautiful. Yeah, it's it's one I wish more people would grow. Yeah. And again, you got you. It's great to decorate at Christmas time. My goodness. Right. And so you say they grow this on the west coast. So yeah. if you were gonna to get this here in North Carolina or on the east coast, they would. Yeah, you would go to a garden center and say, buy it from the West Coast. Almost all conifers are produced on the West Coast because they have a much better difference between day temperature and night temperature. Right. And that's what makes conifers grow is that difference in temperature. So they grow so much faster. We just can't afford to grow them here on the east. So right. just get any garden center, tell them to order you an AB's born muliana off the West Coast. And there you go. Nice. Come on. Are you, are you, are you, are you going to be in the video? <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to be in the video? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, anytime you're ready. <laughs> okay. This is a, just an incredible plant for us. This is a hardy Scheffleria. So for those of us that go down to Florida for vacations, I remember as kids going down to the Disney area, you see Scheffleria's everywhere. That's, a, that's the great understory tree, but you don't think of them being able to grow up here in, in Zone 7B. But this is, 
a Delavay's Schefflera, Schefflera Delavay, it's a, a Chinese plant from the Sichuan area that's incredible. It, it's absolutely rock hardy. This one's been through 16 degrees just a few weeks ago. Looks absolutely fantastic. Slow growing, this has been in for probably about nine years. Uh, eventually it'll mature out around eight to nine feet, so it's not a big tree, but it gives you that wonderful tropical look here in uh, temperate North Carolina. Uh, first cousin to the Chef Larry is, is this plant. This is a Fatsia, F-A-T-S-I-A. Uh, if you get down in deep south, you see a lot of these the common green ones, uh, but this is a variegated one, and, and it's, it's sort of got a neat story for me. This is a, was sort of a lust plant for the late J.C. Ralston, and he finally got somebody to bring it back from England, and every plant in America was propagated from that one plant that J.C. got brought in. Uh, it's really incredible. Here we are in the middle of winter, on what is normally considered a tropical. It looks absolutely fabulous. Just finished flowering, has beautiful spikes of sort of alien looking white flowers, and then it'll be followed up by purple seed here in a little bit. Uh, but what an amazing, again, a, a place to, to give that tropical feel. This is a 20 year old plant that's never been pruned. So it's gonna max out at six, six and a half foot tall, uh, probably eight to 10 foot wide. That is the biggest, uh, it will ever get, never needs pruning. Uh, and again, just incredible. It'll take some sun as well as take all shade. So this plant has a great range of where it will grow. This is a, an unusual tree you don't see a lot it's called the wheel tree. And it's named that because the leaves are sort of aligned like spokes on a wheel in a circle. This is the genus Trochodendron. This is Trochodendron aureolioides. This plant is so odd, it's in its own family. There, there, there was nothing else related to it, so it had to create a family just for this plant. It's very slow growing. This is about a 15-year-old plant that's never been touched. So this is a specimen tree. This is something you want to put in a very special area. Eventually, when your grandkids are around, it's gonna get large. We saw these in the wild in Taiwan. They had trunks like this. They were amazing. So those must be many hundreds of years old. Uh, but what an amazing plant. It has very odd looking flowers that flowers in spring and leaves these weird seed pods, unlike anything else you've seen. And again, that's why it get kicked out of all the other plant families and put in its own. So let's take a quick break from uh, talking plants for a minute and just talk about what motivates you at, you know, what, what, what what's your goal with 28,000? taxa. <laughs> well, it, it's all about biodiversity. We believe that the healthier a garden uh, comes from having the most diversity you can have. It's right. just like society. We know that we bring people from all over. Society is much healthier. The gardens are the same. You bring plants from all over. The garden is mm -hmm. much healthier. It really, it really makes us sad when people want to limit their gardens to only natives of this county or natives of this state. That's not healthy. That's not what, again, what if we did that with people? What if we restricted people to say, we only want people who are native here? Would that right. really be a, a desirable outcome? I don't think so. So people lose sight of that. So it's, a, it's about preserving genetics. We are an ex situ conservation site. So for us, if you want to preserve plants, and we've got a lot of rare plants, okay? I'll give you an example. There are 453,000 species of plants on Earth. 36.5% of them are endangered or threatened. Right. We have to save those. If we leave those alone where they, where they evolved 100,000 right. years ago, are they going to survive with a changing climate? I would contend no, because they're endangered because they're right. not very well adapted. They need nurseries. They need homeowners to grow those plants, propagate those plants. Right. So for us, it's about learning, it's about propagating, and it's about making plants available worldwide. So it's conserving genetics because every plant has the right. potential to solve a problem for humans. Right, yeah, so cure cancer, and, well, whatever else. We don't know, we don't even know. We, no. we can't even begin, we can't even begin to know. And the other thing is, you know, um, that I don't think people know is what partly is what's also driving them to extinction is, um, medicinal use, folks using, mm -hmm. wanting to have medicinal medicines and actually yeah. hunting these plants down in the wild to near extinction levels. They, they really do. I mean, many of the uh, mountains we climbed in mm -hmm. China, Korea, you see people in the mountains with tubs that represents thousands, thousands, maybe 10,000s of uh -huh. dead plants that right. were harvested for medicinal use. So a lot of that 
is not sustainable. Right. And so we do have to, in some areas where that's a problem, we've got to cultivate. We've got right. to get these plants in cultivation, and that's our goal. Nice. Okay, uh, these are Lenten roses or hellebores. Hellebores are a, a fascinating plant. They're primarily a Balkan native, uh, so they grow over in this wonderful vacation destinations like Bosnia and Slovenia and Croatia. And uh, they're winter flowering plants, which is really neat. Now, they're just coming into bloom now, so you can see the flowers. As a lot of people talk about cutting foliage back, when to do it, when not to do it, we come in and do it the minute we see color in the blooms. We come in and take the old foliage off. So what we're interested in doing is creating a beautiful visual show in the garden. So by simply removing the old growth, leaving the new growth on, And see how much better that looks. You've got because the old growth can get holes in it. That's been there for a year, so it's going to get tattered from things falling on it. And then you have this wonderful garden. We don't like to take it off early because it shades the hellebore and it keeps it dormant longer. So it really protects it through the hardest part of the winter. Once those uh, flowers are up above the leaves, you might as well go ahead and take the leaves off because it's not going to do any good. It's not going to protect it anymore and the new leaves are coming out, so it's not gonna take any energy away from the plant. So it's all about timing when you do that. Now these group are known as Hellebores hybridus. Hybridus means it's got five, six species in it. And that's where we get all the amazing colors. In the wild, these are either green or green with a little purple. So it's taken humans uh, decades now to really cross those and get these amazing colors like the, the purples, the reds. Now these are all fertile, the hybridists all. So they will seed around. So if you buy a purple one, it's gonna seed if you don't go in and do a little circumcision there before the seed drop. And those seed will come in an array of colors from its entire lineage. So you'll have some pinks, some whites, some purples, etc. If you want that, that's great. Just, just understand that it will produce lots of seed. Now, the option in breeding this happened recently is we now have sterile hellebores. So let's take a look at those. So here is one of the sterile hellebores. This is known as the Ice and Roses series. Well, hey, Kit Kat. Yeah, she likes hellebores as well. Uh, these are sterile. These cannot produce seeds. So whatever color you buy, that's what you will have. You will never have but one. Now you can come in and divide them. Uh, hellebores, once they get old enough, you can divide them in late summer, early fall through winter. Do not divide them during the rest of the year. That's not going to be good. But the, the sterile ones are bred for really great foliage, really incredible flowers and again, no seed. So you do need to know when you're buying a Linton Rose, are you buying a sterile one or a fertile one? To, sh to see, show you how far hellebores have come, <laughs> this is one of our wild collections from Slovenia. So this is what hellebores look like. The flowers are fairly small. They're generally green with a little bit of purple in them. So you can see, this is not, this is not what's gonna sell in a garden center. So breeders really had to take it from this point to what we've seen now with those larger flowers, much more intense colors. So it's amazing what humans can do simply by recombining those genetics. So you're not pruning anything we, in we, the garden? No, no trees, shrubs ever get pruned. Some perennials right. in spring obviously get cut back, but no, we don't believe in pruning. We, we believe right. in trading in your head shears for a shovel. <laughs> right. If you think it needs pruning, use the shovel once and not the head shears for 50 years. Right, okay, okay. So uh, this one of these fascinating things to me, and I, and I pointed out the pruning thing because this, this Akuba is so perfect. Uh, you know, it seems like it's had to have been, mm -hmm. it had to have been sheared. So this is one of, one of your introductions. This is one of the amazing things in our industry because um, we, we talked about the other day, like a, a nursery that's selling, you know, a typical nursery is probably less than 200 tax mm -hmm. maybe at any given time a yeah. specialty nursery maybe mm -hmm. 1500 mm -hmm. or something like that and then you got you're sitting here with 
you know, 27,000 things that you're, that, that you're working with. I see akubas all over the place that are just beautiful in specialty, in gardens. Mm -hmm. And then in the trade, we've got two, maybe three. May pick to rot, gold dust and some sort of green one. Yeah. <laughs> to, to talk to me about this one as your introduction and, and the ones, that, uh, some of the others that are your favorites in the garden. Um, wow, akubas are such a wonderful plant. There is no other shrub that will grow as it does in dry shade that right. is evergreen. There's, there's nothing. Akubas are sort of like bell-bottom jeans. They go in and out of fashion. So you got everybody 30 to 40 years. They come back in fashion and they get really hot and then nobody wants them. Uh, this is one we named Pac-Man. Uh, this is a 20-year-old plant uh -huh. that's never been touched with a pruner. So to me, I don't understand the, the love that people have for pruning chairs. It, it, they do it because their neighbors do it. And they do it because they put the wrong plant in the right place wrong place so for us it's about coming go to your botanic gardens mm -hmm. look at the plants see how they grow and that way you can get them in the right place but they're amazing they're just getting ready to come into bloom yeah. akubas are incredible flowering plants they flower for valentine's day right. what other plant flowers what are right. the shrub flowers for valentine's day right the this flowers, one holds them up big and tall as well they do the flowers are incredible they're this wonderful purple they're just absolutely fascinating. They're not huge, but there's a lot of them. So, I mean, th this is not a pansy, uh, but th the cluster is just amazing. So we've got over 130 different akubas growing right. here in the gardens. The, the diversity is amazing. So yes, it's shocking that we only have a handful yeah. in the trade. Yeah, it's kind of wild. This is a genus of plants called Ruscus or butcher's broom. This is a, uh, they go through most of Europe and a little bit into Asia. Uh, Ruscus are really odd because they flower right in the middle of what we know of as leaves. So if you actually look at the, well, yeah, it's hard to pull them because they, they have little spines on them. The, uh, the flowers come right out of the middle of the leaves. And when the flowers finish, the fruit comes right out of the middle of the leaves. And this is amazing. So normal Ruscus, you have male and female. This is, uh, this is on the, uh, the scale of sexual. This has both male and female. So this is a, what's called a hermaphroditic form. So it flowers without needs of a pollinator and it fruits without it. So this thing is in fruit almost all year. Its peak season is gonna be fall all the way through winter and all the way through spring. And to me, to have something that looks like Christmas in your garden without you having to go out and put the red on it, it's pretty darn amazing. Ruscus vera, we have some that are five feet tall. This particular one, 18 inches tall. This is from the garden of the late Elizabeth Lawrence, which is the South's most famous garden writer. She was amazing. She talked about this plant extensively. And we have named this one Ruscus Elizabeth Lawrence in her honor. Uh, it's, just a, it's just an extraordinary plant. These clumps would be about 10 years old. So it never gets out of, uh, out of size for any kind of garden. It grows in sun, it grows in shade, it grows in absolutely bone dry conditions. It's, it's been this great pass along plant, but you almost never see it at a commercial nursery because you just, there's no sources for it. So this is a plant that's really special to us. And, and I really think anyone that has a, a garden that, that needs something of this stature in it, it's, it's just incredible. One thing I want to uh, talk about here is how beautiful this garden is in the winter time. And I've probably talked about winter gardens, winter gardens to the point of people not, I mean, not probably checking out on me at this point, <laughs> but you said something that really put it in perspective the other day when we were walking and talking, which was if you concentrate on your winter mm -hmm. garden, the rest of the year, your garden's going to look terrific. Absolutely. Yeah. If it yeah. looks great, if it looks good in the winter, yeah. it's going to look fabulous the rest of the year. Right. But everybody focuses on spring. Spring is the easiest season. Right. Anybody can do spring. That right. requires no right. ability at all. Winter, on the other hand, requires some thought. Right. And go into gardens like this and go, mm -hmm. you know, go into botanic gardens, mm -hmm. go into and seeing and things in your neighbor's yard. I've talked about this a lot, but I thought you just really summed it up perfectly as if your winter garden looks great, your garden is just gonna look, is gonna look fantastic. So uh, one more plant, um, uh, Tony's agreed to do a couple other videos where we're gonna expand on um, 
kind of the, the future of the business and mm -hmm. one maybe and then and talk about you know opportunities mm -hmm. for people and employment in this business and then another one where we will tackle a little bit of plant breeding you know sure. what you have going on here at the nursery so let's talk about this holly that's behind uh, us one of my favorites this is uh, solar flares was developed uh -huh. here in north carolina by the uh, former unique plant nursery in chapel uh -huh. hill this is a sport off one of the red hollies this is one of the truly finest hollies we grow that's never been touched with a pruner this is now about 12 years old it's the growth rate is not fast it's right. not slow it's sort of that perfect size and it looks so great i mean the leaves are great there's no damage on it it's just uh it's got that beautiful variegation, completely stable, no reversions on it. Right. It's, it's just to me, that's what a perfect landscape plant should look like. Uh, obviously a little was cut out here just to maintain this path, but the yes. rest of this, it would have been super narrow on its own. Yes, without... yes, it's not a it's not a wide plant. So you've got probably a six to eight foot. Right. So again, in small areas where you need uh, uh, something uh, really special, really attractive, but not too wide. So it's that's why we right. bring people to gardens so you can see what the mature plant's going to look like and then fit it in the right place. Right. Beautiful. Beautiful. So th uh, thank you very much. Uh, you've got open house at the end of the last weekend in February and the first weekend in March. Is that correct? I'll put the dates. Yeah, we do. We do, we do the them four times a year. We want to get people in the garden all four seasons because people don't realize what gardens can right. be like each season because they don't have the plant diversity. So uh, those weekends, uh, we're here Friday, Saturday, eight to five, Sunday, one to five. And we hope people will come out right. and experience and get some inspiration for their own gardens. Yeah. And then of course, uh, plantdelights.com for your mail order the the, sure. the part the part that feeds the engine for all of the all the play that <laughs> it, it does right. yes we send right. plants all right. over the world so no matter where you are we can get plants to you okay beautiful um and you've seen some of the b-roll in this video of just how beautiful this place is so it's worth a trip i don't care how far you are away if you're you know if you want to come through and walk through something this garden every time i come and i say i've said this many many times I don't care how advanced you are as a horticulturalist, something will stump you in this garden every time. <laughs> every time I'm standing over something like, what in the, what is that? Uh, so thanks again, Tony, for participating. Sure, thanks, Jim. Great.